I'm Jordan Kelly. I'm the CEO of RoboCoin. Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, I just kind of want to run through a few things, but you know, first we know that Bitcoin's really exciting. It's a big deal. We know that it has the potential to disrupt a ton of industries. Um, uh, we also know that you know, the industries that has the potential to disrupt are enormous, like really, really enormous. What we've chosen to focus on, and I think it's a big one, I think it's really exciting. Um, the reason we get excited about it is that you know, one, of these, one of these innovations comes every so, you know, two decades or so. Right? We have the personal computing industry, we have the internet, and now we have Bitcoin. And you know, when we look at it, when I look at business, I think about what is the root of problems? And you, know, you try and solve for the root. So you know, the root of business is money, it's capital. What is the access of capital and how do we use it in the most efficient, simple way? And I think Bitcoin solves that really, really well. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what we do at RoboCoin. What we've built is Bitcoin's first ATM. Uh, it's, this one's not as pretty as the new one, but it is this big, beautiful 800 pound kiosk with bank rate technology. A top of the line cash dispensers, top of the line cash acceptor, a palm vein scanner, an ID scanner, all of it is running RoboCoin software. We launched in Vancouver. I don't know if anybody of you heard of it, but we had, you know, it was kind of a sweet deal for Bitcoin because it put it on the map in, in a really interesting way. And we think that it really adds, you know, the machine adds tangibility to the product, to Bitcoin. And you know, so we launched, I think you know, Forbes called us the, article, the machine that launched 1,000 articles. Uh, Brock calls us the on-ramp to Bitcoin. Um, we like to think that we're finally providing accessibility to something so exciting and so ground, you know, just groundbreaking that you know, it's, it keeps us up every night. You know, since we launched in Vancouver, and these are just the numbers that we've disclosed, we did over $1 million in transactions in 30 days. Right? That is people coming to the machine and just piling in thousands of dollars at one time. Pretty amazing. Since then, you know, that, that kind of drove a lot of excitement and a lot of traction. At that point, you know, right now we've sold, we're selling about one RoboCoin a day. We sell them for 20,000. We make them for slightly less. The margins aren't super exciting on the hardware. But what the business offering is is really sweet. We sell these to you know, these operators all around the world, and our operators are entrepreneurs. They are really smart, reasonably well-capitalized guys who see the future in this, who understand that bringing a RoboCoin to their community is going to change everything. It's going to provide their community, their local environment, accessibility. But also what that means is we're creating these little money portals all over the world. And God, I wish I could remove that. Um, well, there's a map below that with all of the countries that we've sold this to. And in the next two months, we're going to be going all over the world. We just launched in Austin. We're going to Hong Kong, Shanghai, Taiwan, Seoul, all over Australia. We're going all over Europe. We're going to South Africa. We're going to Israel. We're going everywhere. And the reason we're able to move this quickly is that we've distributed our risk. So we sell these machines to operators, and operators are tasked with three things. Number one, they are in charge of dealing with their regulations and compliance. Number two, they're tasked with making sure that their customers are really happy and they have a kick-ass location. And then number three, they're charged with, or they're, they're tasked with stocking their machines with inventory. Our guys are in the business of selling cash for Bitcoin and selling Bitcoin for cash. And business is very good. Business is, you know, business is really good. These guys sell for spread, so they charge fees. So a customer walks up to the machine, they want to buy $1,000 worth of Bitcoin, they pay 3%, of which RoboCoin takes a small cut. So the problem that, you know, oh, no, that's good. Yeah, we'll go with this one. So as you can see, this was, this is the number one. This was our prototype that was in John's garage. John's our chief technology officer. Couldn't be here today because he had to fly to Austin. Um, but this was, this was our first guy right here. This was the one that we sold. This was our first unit that we ever sold. We had our guys from Vancouver fly out to Reno. This is in Reno. Um, we, we moved to Las Vegas. Uh, but you know, guys flew in Reno. We picked him up in the back of John's bed, in the back of John's truck, drove him over to John's shitty house, and walked him into the garage. They then tried the machine for the first time. 
scan their palm with the, our janky palm vein scanner sticking out right there and bought like $40 of Bitcoin and sold $40 of Bitcoin a piece. After they removed their jaws from the table, from the ground, they bought five units and Vancouver came about. When we set out to, you know, we set out on this, on this, on this path, but the reason we set out on it was because of John's brother. John's brother, Mark, was a big Bitcoin trader for a while. And you know, he was going and meeting, he was doing the local Bitcoin thing. He was going and meeting guys in Starbucks with a bag of cash and doing you know, random deals to the point where his reputation was really starting to get good and people were calling him. Guys from Dubai or guys from Hong Kong or guys from New York, they're calling him up like, dude, I want to buy some Bitcoin because I, I hear you've got it. Um, and I hear you give a good service and I hear you're reliable, blah, 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 blah. Mark's like, well, I can't really scale this business. So he calls his brother, John. John you know, says, John, I need you to automate this. John builds this sweet prototype right here, which is indeed RoboCoin. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve you know, some big problems. So, number one, cash in Bitcoin is like peanut butter and jelly. Like, if you think about what, you know, what, what is Bitcoin, it's an irreversible transaction. If I send you a Bitcoin, I can't get it back. It doesn't happen. Like, there's no bank, there's no daddy that I can call and like, say, I need my Bitcoin back. It doesn't happen. This is, Bitcoin is the irreversible transaction, the same way that cash is. So we look at Bitcoin and cash in perfect parallel. And I understand like, you know, the idea of cash doesn't scale. Cash isn't on the internet. How does, how does, this, how does this scale? This is, this is why we build hardware. So cash and Bitcoin is like peanut butter and jelly. And then the next big problem is that identity, ver identity verification processes is not grandma friendly. Like going on to, and, and again, I think Bitstamp, I think Coinbase, I think all these guys are doing an amazing job with what they have to work with. But they have to deal with identity fraud. And the idea that I can walk, I can, you know, I can log into my computer and I can be 35 different people at one time. There's no biometric verification that I am anybody else. So. That is a, that's kind of a big problem that yields the idea that, you know, you only want when you sign up, you have to give them your ID, you have to give them your bank account, you have to give them your utility bill, then you have to wait a few days for shit to clear. Kind of a bummer, my dad's not gonna do it, my mom's not gonna do it, and like, you know, all the people around the world who do not have access to the internet, they're not gonna do it. So, that's problem two. And then big problem is regulations and compliance. So. I'm sure some of us might have heard of the guys at FinCEN, and uh, FinCEN is you know, who controls anti-money laundering. And anti-money laundering and know your customer compliance is a really big deal in today's Bitcoin game. So all operators have to register as a money service business with, with FinCEN and go and get their money transmission license in their individual state. That is you know, a bit of a grueling process, but again, that's why we're able to scale so fast is that we kind of mitigate and distribute that risk onto all of our operators. Money laundering is pretty frowned upon, so we solve that. Consumer protection is a really big deal on the state side. Money laundering is a really big deal on the federal side. Both of those are gonna be solved. Now, we had three goals when we looked at our enrollment process. And this, is, this, is, this right here is what makes us truly unique. This is, this is like the, this is if anybody wants to pay attention to some shit, this is it. The enrollment process is absolutely critical. Number one, we wanna make sure that customers can enroll fast, right? That means it's pretty frictionless, they can do it quickly, and they can get instantaneous gratification. Number two, we wanna make sure that anybody that is being enrolled, our operators are going to have full customer visibility, and they're gonna have control over their transactions. And then the last part, and I think this is the real doozy, is we want customers to be able to back up the truck and just like fire in 10, 25, $35, $100,000 at one time. Reasonably difficult problem to solve, but I think we've done a really good job of it. So going back to why we're the on-ramp. What we've done is we've created this enrollment process that gives people the ability to walk up to our kiosk and create a bank grade profile. Now think about what is a bank grade profile? What is like, what's, we, you know, when you look at banking's best practices, what are they? Banking's best practices is you walk up to a teller at you know, Wells Fargo and Lisa's sitting there. And you go and walk up to Lisa and you say, hi Lisa, I'd like to set up a bank account. So Lisa's sitting here, she can biometrically verify that you are in front of her. The next thing that she does is she, you, know, you, have, you hand her your government ID, she looks at her ID, she writes down all of your information, more than likely with a pen, and then faxes it and then they do some more things. 
And then last thing she does is she makes sure that you are the face on the ID. So that's like, that's the bank. What we did is we said, all right, let's do that, but with software and hardware and make it infinitely faster and remove the human error. So customer walks up to our machine, they tap, and they enter in their phone number. We send them a verified, we send them a verification. So now we have part one of the factory authentication. We have what they have. The next thing that they do is they enter in their PIN. So they create a PIN on the fly on the kiosk. So now we have what they know. And then the next step is they scan their palm. Now, I know that there's like a lot of fear with biometric authentication, but we chose the palm being scan for a reason. The palm being scan is actually not like a print. It's actually an infrared picture of your palm vein pattern, which is completely unique to you as a human being. And it biometrically associates you, the customer, with the, with the account that you created, which gives ridiculous security to anybody who actually signs up. So we, have, we now have three things, three factors of authentication. We have what you have, your phone, what you know, your pin, and what you are, your hand. The next thing that happens is the customer takes a picture of their face at the kiosk, and then they scan their government-issued ID. From there, we scrape all that information off the ID, store it, index it, and then also ensure that it's not a fraudulent ID and make sure that it's not like, you know, on the government watch list, you're not a terrorist, etc. If you are, then you're rejected, you're not allowed to use the machine. But what we've done right there is we've just created a true banking customer. That's a, and, and we think about what banking customers are, it's a really, really exciting thing. And it gives us the ability to let guys go in and back up the truck and deposit $10,000 in cash. We have a lot of really happy customers. You can see we've got grandma and my man over there. This kid is really cool. He's like a little miner and he just goes and like peels off 500 from the machine pretty often. Um, we also have, you know, a lot of journalists have covered us and they're pretty stoked about what we're doing. Um, I want to kind of quickly go over like what we're doing as a team and as a company. So John Russell is my, is my partner and chief technology officer. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. He is this angsty young programmer with like ridiculous social acumen. Unfortunately, he doesn't get to you know, use it that often because he's behind his four monitors. Um, we also have Chris Yoder, who's a senior software, previously senior software at Intuit. And then we have my man, Sam Glazer, who's the guy who's in charge of getting us all of this earned media, like millions of dollars of earned media, kind of a beast. We're hiring. We just got onboarded two more guys. We've got a node guy and our C-sharp guy, but we're still hiring a couple more node guys. We're hiring a really good senior Java guy, so seriously, if anybody has a good senior Java guy, send it my way and I'll send you a Bitcoin. Um, also, maybe a little front-end design guy as well, that would be nice. Um, as you can see, we have a really luxurious office right there. It's really nice. You see John in his, that's John Russell, in his pajama pants. Um, he took off his robe for that one, and Sam's sitting right back there. We're based in downtown Las Vegas. Uh, if any of you haven't really been there, you should definitely come check it out. It's you know, if you're like a really if you're a smart guy and you want to come and solve you know quite possibly one of the world's biggest problems and provide banking to the unbanked and provide and completely change remittance and build a real banking network, uh, you know you should probably come and say what's up, or just you know come have an have a coffee after here and talk to me. Uh, and that's about that. Thanks. Questions? Yeah. Good work, dude. We have fun, huh? So where's the nearest one that I can use? In Austin. Or Vancouver. Actually, no, Vancouver's closer. So pop up there. Oh yeah, uh, we're, we're like damn close on San Francisco and actually California, like we've got, we have five guys that are working on their money transmission licenses right now. They're just like, they're on the doorstep of getting it over the goal line, but it is like, ugh, it's agonizingly close, agonizingly close. Uh, yeah, we're going to, well not right now, we're going to be launching, these are all like, oh, I forgot, all of our machines, like they're all paid for up front, so like, you know, we've been... Oh, I forgot, we are not capitalizing, we haven't raised any money, um, we just built this thing the old-fashioned way and you know, make good money on our sales and enjoy our fee revenue as well. Uh, but we've got a ton going to Europe, Amsterdam, London, Paris, Prague, um, Barcelona, Madrid, we've got Jerusalem as well, and Portugal, Sam's about to close.
I have, I have two parts of this question. First question is about the regulatory requirements for AML and M, uh, MTLs. Yeah. Can you kind of clearly delineate where the responsibility and any fiduciary obligations belong between your company selling this potentially dangerous financial in, financial tool uh, and what liability extends to you and what you can actually rely on the operators of doing for uh, MTLs and OFAC and anti-money laundering and reports like that. That's uh, the first sort of division question. The second was uh, if you could kind of clarify if there is additional revenue on the back end or you just make the sale of the, uh, of the hardware and then you're done. There is additional revenue on the back end which are, we, we, we take a small percentage of the fee revenue on a perpetual basis. The operators again, are tasked with the regulation, right? So they are, so what they're doing is they're buying our hardware and they're simultaneously using their exchange account. Robocoin connects with like Bitstamp or Vault of Satoshi or all these other exchanges. We've got some patent pending technology on that. Um, so that way our guys never have to speculate and like use a hot wallet. So like the worst thing that would happen is like I sell a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, Bitcoin's at a thousand dollars and it drops to like 600. I'm then like, you know, out of 400 pocket, you know, out of pocket 400. Instead what our software gives our operators the ability to do is just hold capital in their exchange account. So a customer wants to fire a thousand dollars in the machine, software sends a thousand dollars, a request for a thousand dollars from the operator's Bitcoin, Bitstamp account. They buy from the market and then send to the customer mitigating the risk. Good. Um, so I love cryptocurrency, but I think there is a problem with it right now with Bitcoin. Um, it seems 80% of the Bitcoins are owned by like a thousand people I've heard. So the distribution model is a little messed up. And I know that there, um, there are other alternative currencies out there. Do you think that uh, your machines will be able to pick up a better currency in the future? Um, totally. Yeah. No, it's like, it's right now it's about market education. So it's like a few things for us. It's about creating ridiculous accessibility across the world, then also educating the world on how, you know, how game changing this can be. So eventually what we are, we're, we're long on decentralized virtual currencies. If that's Bitcoin, if that's something else, we're down. And furthermore, it's just a software update away. No, we use, we use Bitstamp pricing. Uh, who sets the fees for the ATM? Operators customize the fees. So they, they just make whatever they want. And then you get Correct. 5% of that? No, 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 no. Like, operators would, like, let's say, for example, the operator sets it at 5%. We would take a small percentage of that fee revenue. Oh, I'll repeat the question, thanks. Yeah, so he's asking how much are regular ATMs. It really depends, like if you want to go and do like the cash in, cash out at Bank of America, that's like a $65,000 debolt ATM. Um, ours are more kiosks, and I don't even want you to look at them as ATMs. They are really currency exchange kiosks, automated currency exchange kiosks, except nobody knows what an ACAC is. Yes. He, my, my man asks, is uh, our account centralized? The answer is yes. So if you go and use the RoboCoin in Vancouver, you're able to access, access your wealth anywhere in the world. So anywhere there's a RoboCoin, you're able to access your Bitcoin and, use your, you know, and, and enjoy your capital. Well, they're buying the hardware and they're also operating the exchange. So they're, they're the ones who are indeed doing like all of the, all of the transacting. Um, and you know, as, as, as far as all regulators and all, all of our conversations have been exactly that. It's like, yeah, these guys are tasked with making sure that their customers are compliant, making sure that they are compliant, making sure that they're doing all of the work on the exchange and making sure they're protecting their customer. Thanks. Thanks, these guys are gonna stick around for a second if you have more questions.